Turn to your Bible, to the book of Matthew, the eighth chapter. I want to talk to you tonight about keys to radical Christianity. Many of us who call ourselves a Christians uh, must understand what is real Christianity. What is the radical Christian life? You know, uh, many of us uh, say we are Christians, but how much of Christ is revealed in us is such an important thing. And I want to look at from this chapter, throughout this chapter, we're going to be reading this chapter and hopefully we can learn something out of this passage. Uh, and so I hope that we will have some points. I want you to take this and put it in your pad or pen paper. If you just be ready because I'll be giving some scriptures and then we're looking at that. Here we go. Verse 1. When he had come down from the mountain, a great multitude followed him. Sevni followed him. The first sign of radical Christianity is to follow Jesus. You cannot be a Christian without following Jesus. You say, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church. I'm a Christian, but I don't read my Bible. I'm a Christian, but I'm not a part of the family. You cannot be a Christian without really having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if any man wants to follow, he must deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am life. No one goes to Father beside me. So Jesus made a very clear uh, declaration of who he was and he demanded that those who follow him must deny themselves and take up that cross and follow Jesus. And it's quite interesting and uh, to follow me means to turn back from things that used to follow us. So if you are living in a life of sin and addiction and living a life of old things, then when you become a follower of Jesus, you must let go those things and you begin to follow Jesus. You can't keep living the same thing and say, I'm a Christian. So if you live the life of adulterous life, then you cannot live the same life and be a Christian. You cannot walk in the world and with God. you got to choose one thing. Jesus said, the narrow is the way and it's very few that enters it. Because when you follow Jesus, there is a price to pay. Sometimes you got to let go of your old habits, old things of life, old friendships, old relationships, some old teachings, some old gurus, some old religion. Some of the things of past must let go if you're going to be a follower of Jesus. Amen. So Jesus demand that and he said, if you want to be a real follower of Jesus, then you must follow me. Now, I meet people all over the world and many times I meet Christians and especially people that come to me and say, well, pastor, I take good things from all religion. I take something good from Christianity. I take something from other places and, and I make my own. I said, hey, you can make your own, but that is not what God says. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, there is a way that seems good to man, but it leads to destruction. You may look good, but it is not going to lead you to a blessings in life. And so it's important that if you want to be a follower of Jesus, you've got to really follow him. Not half heartedly, not 10%, 100%. Hallelujah. Tell tell you neighbor, 100%. God looks for followers who are going to be sold out for him. And you know, I heard a story about a, a couple that were having a dinner and after the dinner they went back home late night and on the way it was heavy rain and there was a, the roads were not very clear so they they suddenly saw a guy on the right in front of the car just came up and stopped and he had no shirts he was holding his shirt stopping the people and stopping this guy so they they stopped and and his husband said to the wife, he said, I want you to lock the car, but stay out. Let me go and find out because I can't hear what he's saying. It's raining out there. Let me check it out. So he goes out, checks out and find out that this guy is telling him, don't go ahead. There is a bridge that is broken. Because if you go ahead, you will going to die because the bridge is broken. And, and, and to lo and behold, he goes out and sees that truly the bridge is broken. So he goes out and he starts stopping other people. He said, hey, don't go out. He takes his share. So now two people together are stopping others. And then the third and the fourth. And there are other people who started joining them and helping others to stop as the big buses and trucks and other vehicles were coming. They're stopping so that none of them can be perished. I believe there's much more than that, my friend. That right now today as a Christian, when we know there is a destruction in the end, as a church and the body of Christ, we must rise up together and stop people going to hell. We must get more consumed, more passionate because there are people out dying there. And we got to be excited. We got to not worry about it and just go out and reach and save those people because if we don't do it, you are responsible for the souls. And so here is Jesus telling his disciple, if you want to follow me, you got to follow with all your heart. And when you're a follower of Jesus, you become passionately sharing the love of God. The second thing happened in verse 2. And behold, a leper came to him and worshipped him and saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. A lot of people ask Jesus, uh, ask God. And, uh, it's amazing. Lord, if you're willing, 
you can make me clean. And I like that passage of scripture. He said, and the leper came and worshipped Jesus. Before even he could get his healing, before he can get his miracle, he began to worship God. You know, many times Christians, listen to me, if you're a Christian, many times we come to God and we want God to do something for us. We say, God, if you get me this, I will do this for you. If you do this for me, you do that, I will do this for you. Look at this guy. He said, hey, God, I'm going to worship you. I'm going to worship who you are. And Lord, if you are willing, if that is what you want, I'm willing to be healed. I'm willing to be clean. And so I believe that true worship is not worshiping what you get from God. You worship because who God is. You worship God. You come to church. You come to his house. You read his word. You pray. You follow him because who he is, not what you get from him. Many people today want to follow Jesus because what I get. Oh, I prayed. I got my immigration visa. Sort it out. What happened if your visa didn't come through? Would you still trust him? Come on. Uh, what happens if, you, if things didn't work out? Would you still lay down your life for Jesus or you just go back? Now, if things didn't work out, what happens if your marriage didn't work out? What happens if your children didn't listen to you? What happens if your business failed? Would you still love Jesus? That is the key, my friend. This Jesus, yeah, I demanded, he said, he said to this guy, hey, I'm willing to be clean. I, I love that. Jesus is more willing than what you desire. He said, I'm willing to heal you. And Jesus healed this leper. But the greatest thing was, the second thing, to be a follower of Jesus, to be a passionate follower of Jesus, you must be a worshiper of him. Not only just follow him, but worship him. Worship demands a total worthness of him. Who he is. The worship means worship. He is worthy of worship. You know, Abraham Lincoln was a great president of America. And often people would come all other day and they will bring his needs, bring the needs to him and he will solve problems after problems. And, and there was a lady that came and she brought some biscuits and she brought some nice big fresh biscuits. So Abraham Lincoln asked her, hey, what do you want? Why do you brought all this? He said, huh? I said, Mr. President, I see you working the whole day. And I thought, you know, you deserve to have this nice hot biscuit in this cold. And Abraham Lincoln began to cry. He said, man, you're the only lady who saw my need. Whereas most of us, most of other people that came was always wanting from me. And I think there's so many of us today go to God asking God what they can get from God rather than giving him who he is. Look at verse 3. Then Jesus put his hand and touched him and said, I'm willing, be cleansed. Immediately, say with me immediately. I love that. Whenever God touches, immediate things will happen for you. When God touches you, my friend, your, immediate, your situations will immediately transform. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed and Jesus said to him, see that you, that you tell no one else, but go to your way and show to yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. And it's amazing. What Jesus is saying here, hey, obey him. The second, the third principle that God is teaching is not just follow him, not just worship him, but now obey him. So do what I'm telling you to do. And, and whatever he tells you, do it. It's amazing. You know, this guy goes into and starts doing what God has told him to do, what Jesus told him to do. And I believe obedience is better than sacrifice. How many of that? Many people today want to bring sacrifices, but God said, hey, I don't want sacrifice. I want obedience. I heard a story about a couple. They sold their house, their business, and moved to mission. And, you know, and they were in Vivem, and, and I was quite moved by their love and dedication. So I asked the man, I, that is a radical sacrifice. He said, no, pastor, it's not a radical sacrifice. It is a radical obedience. He said, I obey God when God told me to do. And so I took that step of faith, and God has been faithful to me. And I believe it's important. In Isaiah 119, said, if you obey, listen to me, so in Isaiah 119, if you're willing and obedient, you will eat the fruit of the land. Listen to my friend. When you are willingly obey God, there is a blessing that releases. Now there are two ways people obey. I can tell you, I'll, I can show you a gun and you obey because I say, hey, you are now obeying out of the fear because you have, I have a gun. But if you really love God, then you will obey him. And so I believe that's important that we understand we serve God, we love God out of obedience. When you obey, there is a blessing in your life. I heard a story about this pastor in Penrith. He's a, uh, he's, I met him a couple of times. He was a senior pastor at Penrith Christian Center. He's one of the world's leader on missions where his church gives millions of dollars. And, you know, they were a small church when they were doing it, their church in the school in, in Penrith, Sydney. And uh, God told him, he said, hey, you know, I want you to take this money that you collected throughout the year. Go and help in the missions. Go and put that money in evangelism. 
So the pastor went to these leaders and said, what do you feel? The whole Went to the church and the whole church decided they will put all their saving, all their money they have gathered for property and you know, they will go and give it. So they wanted to buy one acre land and, and that whole worth of money were now given million, couple of million dollars was given to the missions, world mission. And after a few years of time, they were praying and there was a church that uh, the senior pastor was retiring and that pastor had, uh, had 17 acres of land with the whole property, with school, everything. And so that whole church decided to give a gift to this pastor who had been who had sacrificed and given. You know why? Because he knew if I can obey God, God can bless me. And I believe when you obey God, my friend, God opens doors that looks impossible for us. And I don't know how God can do it, but God can do a miracle. So number one, what is the principle? If you want to be a radical Christian, number one, what? Follow Jesus. Number two, worship Jesus. Number three, Obey Jesus. Number four. Here we go. Chapter, uh, verse five. Now when Jesus heard in Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading to him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dead foot, tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you come to under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. What a promise. What a word. He said, Lord, only speak. He had faith. If you want to be a radical Christian, then a follower of Jesus, then you got to have a faith in him. Have faith in Jesus. Amen. But this guy had faith. He said, man, you just speak and it will happen. And uh, one thing, when, LSA, when our kids go travel in overseas, we go, many times on the car, they will say, have you kept your passport? Have you, have you kept our passport, tickets, everything is okay? How many do that? How many we be on the way? And as you get in the car, you, you make sure that everything is there. And I will say, yes. They haven't seen it, but they trust me. They trust on my word. They didn't see where's the passport, let me show it. They just trust on what I've said to them. If they can trust my word, my friend, how much can should we trust in God's word? If God says something, we can trust if God is faithful. Amen. Hallelujah. Another proverb says in Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. And live not in your own understanding. And I believe one of the things is to when we trust him, God does great things. Even for healing. You know, recently I had a story about this Punjabi lady that was, we, Alice and I, visited in Sydney a few, uh, about a few months back. And I met this lady. I was so moved by her testimony. She said she was a, a sick. She had nobody ever told her about Jesus. But somehow in that village, somebody told her a, a literature and got a, a tracks about Jesus. And so she said, if this Jesus is, a, if, see, one day she said, if this Jesus is real, he can fill this both lake with the water. Now, that was a summer season. There was hardly any rain. And, uh, you know, there was a big lake, almost 10 feet, uh, 10 foot deep. Uh, it was totally, it's a big lake. And she said, it's just impossible. So I told God, if, if Jesus, if you are real, you can fill this both lake and fill it equal. So that when I, when I get up in the morning, I know you are real. So at night, she went and prayed and slept. When, when she got up in the morning, she, the next day, the both uh, both of these uh, tanks, both of this lake was filled with water. She has completely forgotten about this. And she was telling me, after a few days, after a week, she was cleaning the house and looking at this window. And God speaks to her and says, hey, I kept my promise. Have you kept your promise? And straight away, she began to cry and she began to repent and she gave her life to Jesus. Today, she's a follower of Jesus in Sydney. Has got an amazing restaurant. We, Alice and I went and spent some time with her. But I was just thinking how radically she was willing to obey when God told her, you know, that I could do something. So God led her and, and told her how to start a business. They started a business. Amazing couple and God is now prospering them. I believe, you know, they, their heart is amazing. Their heart is saying, Pastor, we are making this money so that we can send all that money in helping Punjab and rich Punjab for Jesus. So what a passion. What a passion for people who's got a dream, not about themselves, but building the kingdom of God. Here is to have faith. To have a radical follower of Jesus, you must have faith. Look at verse 14. Now when Jesus had come into Peter's home, he saw his wife, mother, laying in sick with fever. So he touched her with hand, and the fever left, and she arose and served them. I like it. Here's the fifth point, serve them serve Jesus. A true follower, a radical follower of Jesus will serve Jesus. He will be happily serving. Allah, I don't know about you, 
most of us must serve Jesus. If we are followers of Jesus, we must be excited about serving. You know, when I ask you, I need some ushers, you should be, hey, the whole church is here to help us. Because we are called to serve. Amen. And I believe Jesus uh, encourages us. He said, I did not come to be served, but I came to serve. And I believe as a Christian, there are two places you must serve. Number one, you must serve in the house of God and you must serve outside in the community. You know, it's very easy to, to just uh, be in church, but how about serving outside of the four walls of this building? You know, there are, there are ways you serve God. You serve God by giving. You serve God by getting involved in the church, by doing things as required. And I would really encourage you this week that, you know, in these coming days, as we get more and more work involved, we need more and more people to get involved in serving and doing things for God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here's the... So the other way you serve God is we serve God by outset going out of those four walls. You know, Matthew, for Jesus tells a story about, you know, there's a day coming when he will separate the goat and the sheep. I really believe there's a day coming when he will choose who are his and who are his. You know, when, uh, when, 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 you, when you start to serve outside, you know, I like some young people here in the church used to go out and make some food and help poor people. That's great. But don't do it for one time. Do it as often. You know, sometimes um, you go out and do grocery and you, you see you're doing a grocery and you see somebody ahead of you uh, uh, has a little coin. He's running away a coin and you help them out or you put some more money on them. You know, you, there are so many ways we can help others or you see somebody's car broken down and you, you stop your car and you help that person. You know, there, there's just a way you and I can serve our community all the time, looking for opportunities to serve. Maybe your neighbors, maybe your families around you. There is a need that is there and I believe that we as a church must get involved in serving people. Maybe visit old people's home and you know, just go, even though you're, you may have no family there. Just go and visit and and meet somebody on the behalf of the church and say, I'm from ICLC. Just come to, just to see and how I can help you. And maybe if you have a gift of singing, sing some song. Or, and maybe it's help of cleaning, just clean their house or clean their room. I believe there's many ways you can serve Jesus. Amen. There's a many ways. If you, the Bible says, if you serve to one of the least of that, you have served unto me. Jesus said, if you do it to the poorest, you have done it to me. When you do the weakest, the poorest, the children, the, well, the old and the older people, the more you serve, my friend, you're opening a door for blessing in your life for it. Hallelujah. A radical follower of Jesus is a servant of Jesus. He loves serving. He enjoys serving. I don't know about you, uh, but let me ask you, you know, how is your service? How excited you get about serving? Some people, when service comes, they run away. Eating comes, they're there. Serving comes, let's get out. <laughs> let's not be that kind of Christians. Amen? Here's another one. Matthew chapter 8, verse 18. When Jesus saw a great multitude about him, he gave commandments to depart from the other side. And when the other, and then a certain scribe came to him and said, Teacher, I am willing to follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. What is he talking about? He's saying, stay committed to Jesus. Teacher, I want to follow you. Wherever you go, I will go. Whatever you feed me, I will swallow. When you have that commitment of following Jesus, I believe you are you're committed to stay Jesus. You know, it's amazing. Most of us are committed to Jesus only for our convenience. If Jesus, if it is too cold, I'm not going to church. If it is raining, I'm not going there. If it is over time or something, I get it, I'm going to go there then coming to house. Now, we, we, if there's no parking convenience to me, I'm going to walk so far. Amazing, isn't it? So many Christians. But let me tell you, my friend, God wants us to be totally committed to him. One of the disciples came to him, Jesus, and said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me. And let the dead bury their own. Hmm. I love that. Some people, the first, he said, let me go first and bury. You know, when you put second number to Jesus and first something else in your life, you cannot be a disciple of Jesus. You've got to put Jesus the first in your life. Tell anybody, say, put Jesus first. Look at your next neighbor and say, put Jesus first. <coughs> you know, <clears throat> it's amazing when you stay committed, what a blessing it, it comes. When, when you stay committed to your call, when you stay committed to whatever God calls you. You know, I was 16 when God called me to start this church. Uh, God told me to start the work. And I was, when, I was, when God called me to come here, 
uh, I I remember there was in 1990 and said, hey, go to New Zealand, start working or reaching up the Indian community. I'll tell you, there was time I felt like just shutting down and going back because nothing happened. Nothing happened for many years. It was easy to give up. Pastor Jagil remember, isn't it? Ten years, five years, nothing happened. Two, fifteen years, nothing much happened. Said, Man, feel like giving up. But you stay committed. Stay committed. You know, greatest missionaries today in the world. I was hearing a story of Ivan, uh, the uh, Adelaide founder of the Assemblies of God. You remember that guy? Andrew Russell, R Russell Evans' father? Andrew Evans? Okay. Andrew Evans, uh, he is, I think his father, he was a missionary to India. Uh, he, he went to missionary to India. He was the founder of the Assemblies of God, uh, one of the key leaders of the Assemblies of God. And uh, I, was listening, I was listening to his biography, his life. And he was telling that he went to, 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 he and his wife had a heart for India. So they went to India and they tried to do, nothing happened for five years. You know, and think of it. You preach, you, you, you sacrifice, you go, you, you're reaching out, nothing happens. And then one person gets saved. One person gets saved. Only one person after five years. I know you, 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 you hear people like uh, other, other guys who brought faith, Christianity to India. Who was another guy? Uh, William Carey. William Carey. William Carey was another great guy. I went in for many years. Finally learned. All these guys, they paid huge price. They kept doing it consistently, persistently. They never gave up. They stayed faithful to their call. Listen to me, my friend. You stay faithful to God's call and God in a season will do that. You know, sometimes we, we are looking for big things. God says, hey, it's not about big things. It's about being faithful to what I've called you to. And I will bless it and I will multiply it. My ways are much higher. Listen to me. God said to Abraham, I'm going to give you sons like a star. Did he have that many children? He didn't see that many sons. He only had one son. Then his, his son had two sons. Isaac had how many sons? Two sons. Then his son's son had how many? Twelve sons. They did not happen in one day. It just kept growing. But there was a process. You understand? But the vision stayed the same. When you get a vision from God, you stay. So be follower, a radical follower of Jesus. Radical Christians are followers of Jesus, worshippers of Him, obey Him, have faith in Him, serve Him, and stay. Here's one. Stay awe of Him. Stay awe of Him. Man, when they get so excited about how God is, you know, after not being just committed, but now you stay off. You look at verse 23. Here's a story about, about this man who's get healed. He said, and when he got in the boat, his disciples said to him, and suddenly great tempest arose in the sea, and the boat was covered and with the wave, and as they were sleeping. But when Jesus, when his disciples came to him and woke him, said, Lord, save us. We are perishing. And Jesus said to him, Why are you fearful, you little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and, and the sea, and there was great calm. So the man marveled. Say with me, marveled. Come on, say it, marveled. Saying, who is this that even the winds and the sea obeys him? What a God we have. What a God we have. You know, my friend, when Jesus in the boat, you can smile in the storm. When Jesus in the boat, you can be excited about the life. Doesn't matter what happens. You know that God is with you. In the midst of the trial, in the midst of the difficulty, you need to stay out of him. And I said, they marveled. He said, who is this Jesus? I don't know about you. How many of you take time to meditate about who Jesus is? If I ask you right now to start writing down some pages, how many pages can you write about who Jesus is? How wonderful he is. How awesome. How he walks on water. How he heals the blind eyes. How he opens the deaf ears. How he heals the lame. How he raises the dead. How he divides the dead. See, man, that Jesus is wonderful. If we know who Jesus is and wonderful God that we have, you get excited about Jesus. You know, if you really know who Jesus is, you cannot sit there. If you really know who Jesus is, you'll be jumping excited. How many really know Jesus? If you didn't know who Jesus is, how wonderful he is, you'll get excited about him. You'll say, man, how awesome and how wonderful, how marvelous he is. And that one, even the wind obeys, the sea listens to his voice. He is awesome. And so my friend, tonight I want to tell you that my Jesus is able to do, he can calm the seas of your life. He can calm the situations of your life. He can command the wind to stop because he is powerful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I had a story about a husband, a couple that were hearing the gospel many times, but they kept rejecting the gospel. 
and once they decided that they will go to South America for holiday. So husband and wife went to holiday. While they were on holiday in some beach, they lost the route and, and they were swimming. They forgot the car key somewhere. They lost the car key. They got really mad. They began to fight with each other. The husband blamed the wife. Wife blamed the husband. Typical fight happened. And so the man decided to walk the other side. Wife decided to walk the other side of the beach. And as they were walking for a couple of miles, the guy walked in and he saw a church. And so he said, oh, I'll just walk into the church. When he walked into the church, he saw a statue of Jesus. And he said, oh, Jesus, but why is it his both hands are fallen on the floor? So he was looking at it. Suddenly a guy walked in and said, hey, sir, how can I help you? He said, hey, how come your Jesus hand is down? He said, oh, the guy said, oh, sir, I, it's a big story. In this village, some years back, there was a big cyclone. And when the cyclone came, the whole of the village, this area, people, all the houses went away. But we decided to come inside the church and we began to call upon Jesus. So Jesus' hand protected us. His hand protected us. So all the cyclone went around, but nothing happened to this church. And we were saved. We escaped. Hearing that guy went back and he began to thought about, man, what is Jesus? If Jesus can save, he can open doors. He can get my keys back. And he began to pray. And, and he sat down and he gave his life to the Lord, made a commitment to God. And he began to walk back to where his car is. As he began to walk toward his wife, his wife on the other side, God has been speaking to her. And she said, God, if you're real, show me. My, show me. Let the angel come and drop the key from heaven. And suddenly a bird falls in and drops the key right in front of her. <laughs> she picks up the key. She says, oh my God, Jesus, you're real, I know. And she walks in and, and here they both meet and they say, hey, I found Jesus. She said, I found Jesus. He said, I found the key. She said, I found Jesus. And they both they hug each other and they tell how wonderful God is. And they were so awesome, full of awesome of how God did miracle for them. My friend, let me tell you, the same Jesus is here today. He does impossible things. He does wonderful things which you can do. Here's the last thing, the eighth thing, verse 33. So when the demon possessed man, saying that if you cast him out, permit me to go away into the herb of the vine. And he said to them, go. This is Jesus saying, go. So when he had come out, they went into the herb of the swine and suddenly the whole herb of the swine were violently, violently down to the steep place into the sea and perished into the water. Then those who kept them fled and they went away into the city and told everything, said me everything, including what had happened of the demon-possessed man. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw Jesus, they begged him to depart from their reason. What an amazing story. The whole city came to Jesus. The whole city came. You know, radical Christians are those who tell others about Jesus. They're not keeping it to themselves. This man, if this wonder God did, I'm going to go and tell others. And when you see a wonders, when you see a miracle, you don't keep it to yourself. You go out and tell others. Says, Come on. I have found the Savior. I have found the Deliverer. Awesome God we have. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, my friend, how excited you are to go out and tell others about Jesus. Let me tell you, you and I live a very short life. And, and, and what we pursue is such an important. What really matters in life is a salvation of souls. You know, when you stand before God one day, you're going to stand before God. And, and, and God is going to judge each one of us. And it's amazing, if we are believers, we are already being judged. Our judgment has been already put on Christ. <clears throat> but our judgment will be a judgment of reward. There will be a time when you'll be rewarded. It'll be interesting to see that all of those that we shared, they'll stand behind us. All those people that we have led to the Lord. This is the people. These are the people that we brought in. An amazing experience will be. And I, I believe that it's important that we really make a decision of our life, of what we really want to live for. What are we living for? What are we, uh, our life is for? What's the purpose of our life is? That's such important. So